Well, welcome to the Everyday Discernment Podcast. Today, I have Tyler Smith with me. Tyler is an NBA sports writer, a basketball coach, and an author. He also has worked in the Christian music industry. Tyler resides in Indiana with his wife and two daughters. Tyler's book, Searching for Seven, is about the journey of seeking God seven days a week. Tyler, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. How are you? Good. How are you doing today? Doing, doing great. Yeah, I, I um, heard about your book, which we'll talk about more later, and I was just really intrigued about the concept of it and something that has been on my heart. And so I was excited to have you on and kind of learn a little bit more about you and your journey. And uh, so just kind of let us know a little bit more about you personally and anything else you'd like to share. Yeah, well, as you mentioned, uh, a lot of different things that I'm involved in, uh, which I'm very blessed to do all these different things. I work with a youth group. Um, wife and two daughters. Um, so not a lot of sleep, but it's great. And, uh, you know, wrote that book and, uh, you know, enjoyed, um, you know, doing virtual tours and, and everything with that. Um, and then I, I coach girls basketball, our season just ended. And then I also do uh, NBA sports writing, uh, mainly for the Pacers here in Indiana. And uh, that's, you know, basketball season's crazy time. But uh, again, just, uh, I think all the things kind of work together pretty well. And, um, Again, very blessed to do all of them. How long have you lived in Indiana? Grew up here. And then when I, I went to college in Illinois, and then I was in Florida for about three and a half years doing youth ministry, moved back here in uh, 2014. Gotcha. How long have you been a Christian? Well, uh, basically my whole life. I uh, grew up in a Christian home. Uh, I think the decision finally became mine when I was 14. Um, instead of just my parents' faith. Um, yeah. and, I, and for a lot of people, when they go to college, they go the opposite way. For me, is when I went to college, when my faith really um, became strong. And um, I started to learn more about what it meant to follow God every single day. And the people I was with, um, the experiences I had really helped lead me to that. Uh, but yeah, it's unfortunate. A lot of people go to college and it's kind of, uh, you know, they say, they say bye to the church and some of them never come back. But um, for me, that's when my faith really took shape. That's cool. That's yeah, that's almost complete opposite of a lot of people. And and I love how you said you made it your own faith. And that's such a big difference between, uh, and I grew up a pastor's kid and a lot of pastor's kids or people just grew up in the church, you know, they did, they, they kind of cruise on the, 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 you know, it's like when you're drifting in a car, you know, you're kind of drifting into the faith based on your parents or a mentor and it really has to become your own so that once you are driving your own car, so to speak, you are in control of it and it, it makes sense to you. And you're not just like, why am I even doing this by the time that you are tempted and in college and have all these other options as an adult, then you're like, why well, I'm, you know, I was forced to church, you know, and I don't really believe what I've, you know, kind of just gone through the motions. And so it's really important at some point, whether it's 14, 24, 40, that you make it your own faith. And uh, yeah. so that's awesome. Yeah. How did you get involved in uh, sports writing? So it's kind of a funny story. When I went to Florida to do youth ministry, one of my thoughts was like, oh man, these people that I'm about to be around, they're not going to like my teams. They're not going to want to talk about, you know, the teams that I love. So I actually uh, created a separate uh, Twitter account and started to blog and podcast. And it was kind of like just a fun thing on the side where a little bit of piece of home, um, you know, something like an outlet for me where I could uh, talk about my teams and actually uh, built a decent little following of uh, Twitter, Twitter fans, I guess. And um, from that, I was discovered by some different people. And when I, when they found out I was moving back, there was a guy who had just created a site. He was running it for a couple of years. He got a job uh, to cover the Oklahoma city thunder in Oklahoma, saw my stuff, called me up and asked if I wanted to take over. So that was like two weeks after I moved home. So I was a little bit upset about leaving the beach and, and the sun. Um, <laughs> but I was like, I'm going back home to family. And then this thing came along two weeks later and I was like, all right, let's do it. That's awesome. Have you always been into the NBA? Yeah, really uh, basketball and baseball. I like football too. Um, but those two sports, uh, I've just been a huge part of my life for a long time. I heard on a side note that basketball cards and are now collectible again. Cause I used to collect them in the 88 to like 94 era. And uh, 
someone said they're like now like Jordan's rookie card was like $7,000 last year. Now it's like $47,000 or something like that. And I was like, wow, I'm going to go through my old collection and see what I have. Yeah. It might be worth something. So yeah, I'm gonna have to go through my lit or my, uh, I've got like some totes of those uh, baseball cards, especially from back in the day. So there's probably, probably <laughs> some that were worth something at least. Yeah. And tell me the, uh, tell me the, uh, the last dance was amazing. Wasn't it? I love that. Oh was, yeah. That and was... that was, I mean, such perfect timing too. I know yeah. they moved it up, but when we were just craving for something to watch and something yeah. that's uh, sports related and that came on every Sunday for two hours and mm -hmm. man, that was, it was so good. The glory days of the bulls. And I'm sure you watched, did you watch Reggie Miller back in the Pacer days? Was yeah. That... Even though, you know, towards the end of the last dance was kind of painful to relive. <laughs> yeah. Right. The, the Pacers were so close, but at the same time, it was, there was always a respect for the Bulls, unlike some teams today, if they team up and it's like, I just don't like them at all. <laughs> Even when the Pacers would lose to those teams, there was a, a great respect there for what we were watching. Yeah, for sure. Cool. So a little more icebreakers here to get to know you a little bit. So what would you say your favorite movie of all time is? Well, speaking of Indiana and being a, a basketball fan, Hoosiers is up there for me. <laughs> of course. Awesome. Love it. What about if you could meet anyone alive or dead, who would it be? That's a tough one. I, I think, um, now what if they spoke a different language? Could we have the same language? You could have a Google translate. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Cause I, I mean, I would love, you know, really, really old school here, but, uh, apostle Paul would love to <laughs> have that conversation with that guy. Yeah. Right. Kind of get his, uh, perspective on maybe today's church be like what do you think about yeah what do you think about american church to the church in united states yeah yeah <laughs> what about a author you would recommend or a book i really love bob goff uh his his style of writing is what i was going for in mine as far as like lots of stories short chapters uh scripture that goes with um kind of what you went through yeah. So he's got three, I believe he's got three books out. They're all amazing. And uh, I would say uh, outside of him, Erwin McManus is one of my mm -hmm. favorites. Yeah. I, I think most of Bob Goff's books are on love or, you know, it's kind of the theme of love and yep. they're, uh, he's very passionate. I've heard him speak a couple of times and haven't read his books, but I've kind of just followed him a little bit and I like what he has to say. Yeah. What about hobbies? What do you like to do personally or with your girls? I uh, love, love music. Uh, I'm just, I'm huge into, I mean, I love Christian music, but I love all types. And, uh, you know, you, it's kind of a tradition, even on Spotify, every, if I'm still, if I'm still awake Thursday at midnight or Friday morning, check out my release radar, go through <laughs> what the, you know, new tunes of the week and love sharing it with people. Just like, you got to check out this band or this, you know, we got to go to this concert we actually just got to go to a concert, uh, socially distanced, like uh, pods of four people, uh, you know, separate rows and stuff like that. But yeah, I saw Toby, Toby Mack and Torin Wills, oh, uh, nice. really good show. Um, so music's up there, anything sporty, still like video games, never grow old uh, video <laughs> Amen. games. Me too. <laughs> got my, got my PS five. Finally, it took me four months to get one. Um, but yeah, hanging, hanging out with the girls, whatever they want to do. Um, you know, they, we, they love, uh, dancing in the kitchen or, or now that it's warm enough here in Indiana, they're going outside and playing with their cars and, and slides and stuff and just whatever, you know, anything they want to do is fun. How old are they? About to be four and two. All right. My daughter's seven. So they, yeah, uh, it's basically whatever they want, right? So if you want to play yeah. dolls, you want to play makeup, you want to go dance. Yep. <laughs> it's just a joy to do it. Yep. Uh, what what was your connection with the Christian music industry? What was uh, time frame around that, or what did you do? That's when I was in college, and there was about three years of it. Uh, one of my friends started a company. It's called the Rockstock Company, and it was mainly Christian rock shows in the Midwest. But um, we were all over, um, you know. So we got to basically be the promoters, put on shows, lots of different venues. Sometimes it'd be a small church show. Sometimes it'd be a you know five thousand auditorium. Um, Switchfoot and Skillet and, you know, those kind of bands. Yeah. Um, and then some of those bands are, you know, some of my personal heroes. So to be able to hang out with them backstage or tour bus and pick their brain, hear new music, 
Uh, it was pretty wild. I, one time I told the, the Newsboys lead singer, uh, his wife, that, hey, you can't go back back there. She had a pass, but I was told to tell him not to go anywhere. And she's like, I'm Peter's wife. And I was like, oh, shoot. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so a lot of fun memories. But yeah, it was about three years in that industry. Wow, that's that's exciting. Cool. So let's move on to uh, examples of discernment in your life. A time you had godly discernment, kind of what that meant, how you knew it was God leading you in a certain direction, and then a time you did not necessarily have the greatest discernment, but how it was a learning, you know, a situation for you. So if you want to start off with the the good discernment in your life and what that situation was. Yeah, I think for me, the a time period that came to mind is, I'm trying to remember the year, but it was maybe 10 or 11 years ago. And I was somebody who was like, never, never dreaming I would ever move away from home. It was never even, it never even crossed my mind. Um, but I felt like through prayer and, and scripture, I felt like there was a, a little bit of a stirring up in there. God may be preparing me that I'm going to have to move because um, I knew a lot of the stuff that I was trying to do uh, at home. Um, there wasn't a lot of opportunity and I just felt like, okay, God, I'm, I'm listening. I'm listening. Uh, you know, let me know, let me know what's up, you know, and yeah. uh, just continue to pray for a long time. And I actually got a, a job offer or not a job offer, a, an interview in Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, I went there, it was a weekend thing. Um, it went really well. And I thought it was like, this is, this is God, this is going to happen. Um, like the day after, or a couple of days after they, uh, they told me that they loved everything about the interview, but they didn't know if I wanted to be there fully. And so I was like, that's, that's kind of my decision, right? They're like, if you want me, <laughs> you <laughs> offer me the job. And then I tell you if I accept or not, I thought that's how it worked. Um, but I was, I was crushed in that moment. Cause here I was thinking like, God, I'm willing, I was willing to go wherever uh, I was not married at the time. So it's like, yeah. I'm going to go, you know, just by myself across the country, um, for you, for this, uh, ministry job. And so I didn't understand it. Well, that very Sunday, the pastor at our church talked about the Abraham and Isaac story. And in, and in that moment, when he shared it, I was like, Oh my goodness. Like I was not at the level of Abraham, but I was, I was showing God, I was willing to do, do this, but he's got something else in mind. Mm. And uh, it was a couple weeks, only a couple weeks after that, probably an even better situation in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, I interviewed there and got that position. And so that's kind of multiple, uh, multiple lessons in one. But I think it started with me listening and trying to discern what God wanted. And then even when the first part didn't work out, instead of me being like, well, you know, I'm just going to live at home forever and <laughs> you know, forget even try, you know, even trying to look for what else, um, it was still listening to God and trying to discern, okay, maybe that wasn't the fit. Maybe something else is coming. Maybe he's preparing me in this, in the meantime. That's so cool. And I love that, how you said you knew in your, in your heart, God was preparing you for something bigger. And a lot of time God works that way where, you know, something's coming, but you're not sure what it is. And God kind of prepares your heart ahead of time for when it does happen. And, but that only happens if we're listening to God, if we're sensitive to what he's telling us, un unless we try to do it in our own effort. And then we usually fail if that's the case. And so, you know, a lot of times when we get to that point where we're now acting upon what we're feeling from God, then we have to look at the peace of God. If that follows us, if, you know, the open doors that are slammed in our face and we're questioning why, like yours, you you know, then you have to go back to God. And then if you don't have that peace of God, then don't try to force that open. Don't try to make it happen in your own effort, but really seek God. Is there a lesson in this? Is there a, a time period in this where I need to be faithful to where I'm at, you know, or do I need to move and, and do with this drastic step, you know, and people that make these drastic steps for God have a piece about it where, other people looking at it were like, why aren't you completely stressed right now? And it's like, well, God is telling me to do this. And there's this like overwhelming sense of peace by them doing it. And that's, yeah. that's something that you can't just project onto someone else because you're not in their shoes. But at the same time, when you're in that and you're actually seeking God, the peace of God will always follow when you're, when you're in his will. And it doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. It doesn't mean that there won't be uh, trials and tribulations and problems, but it does mean that you will rely on God's strength and not your own to get it done. Yeah, I love that. I've had a lot of conversations with students or people 
that have asked for advice. I'm like, how do I know if it's God's will? How do I know if I'm supposed to do this? And that's one thing I've told them is I think ultimately, you know, the scripture is not going to always tell you like, Hey, Jim, uh, go to this college or marry this person, yeah. but it'll give you, you know, obviously uh, direction. And then, and then the peace that passes all understanding um, will eventually, um, you know, be in your life. Uh, like I just, I just feel at peace at this decision that I'm about to make. Yeah. And, you know, I, I say with the sermon a lot, you know, we'll, we'll get it wrong. It's the sermon's like a spiritual muscle. You grow over time. You know, you're not going to be perfect at it from just reading a book or even reading the Bible because we're on this journey of learning more about God and, and getting him more in us. And so when you do make a wrong mistake, you know, don't beat yourself up over it, but learn from it. You know, don't make the same mistake twice, but at the same time, when we do make poor decisions, you know, go back to God and say, where did I fail in this? Did I try to do it in my own effort? Did I not pray enough? Did I not listen enough? You know, we we pray so much and listen so less sometimes that we don't actually wait to hear what God has to tell us. You know, we come to him with all our problems and our requests and our wish lists. And, and then we're like, okay, God, I'm done. I'm leaving. And God's like, well, don't you want to hear what I have to say? And so that's an important part of discernment is, is waiting on the Lord and not trying, even if an opportunity comes and and there's this urgency about it, that I need to make a decision. Well, maybe you don't need to make a decision right away. Maybe you just need to let that opportunity pass if God's not telling you to to jump on it. So cool. So what is an uh, time in your life where you maybe didn't have the greatest discernment, but it was a learning opportunity for you? Yeah, that's another one that like a lot of examples came to mind, unfortunately, or fortunately, however you look at it, a um, lot of, a lot of growth in those moments, but especially as you get older, you look back and you're just like, man, all these decisions made, but thankfully, you know, God used those things uh, for good. Yeah. Um, but I, I remember when I was, um, so I had this girlfriend when I was 19 and 20 years old and basically because of how I met her. I believed it was kind of like a movie. And so I was like, this is from God. This is so from God that this is definitely who I'm going to marry. And I, you know, realized later in life that like, yeah, that was fully from God, but it was not for the reason of marrying the girl. It was for other things. And, and, you know, learning, uh, learning a lot through that relationship to prepare, prepare me for um, later in life who I would marry yeah. And so at the time though, I was just so blinded by, again, how I met this person that I was like, even when there was maybe some warning signs, some red flags, I was like, no, like that wouldn't happen because, you know, I met this girl in this movie like way and, and God <laughs> wouldn't do that, you know? And so, I mean, yeah, I was, I was young, young, dumb and in love as they say. Um, at least I thought I was, but um, I think just in those moments, it was more of my, my thinking, and I was trying to do things the right way. It's not like I was ever, you know, apart from God or, um, you know, denying him, but it was yeah. more like I was, I was kind of playing the role or just assuming again, how I met, how I met her, um, had to be this, you know, specific ways. And, and I think we do that a lot with relationships or even jobs or, you know, different experiences when we think we know, <laughs> we know what God is doing and yeah. don't, don't realize till later what he was actually doing. So, you know, from that, we actually, you know, I even went to her parents uh, to ask for her blessing uh, for, for marriage, even though there was red flags and uh, things came crashing down after that. It was a heartbreaking time period, but I'm so thankful that it happened, you know, and yeah. so grateful that all that happened. And um, I didn't end up getting married till, let's see, another, uh, you know, 10 years after and mm-hmm. just all the things I experience that led me to being much more prepared for, for marriage much later on. But that was a moment when I think I was trying to discern my own will at times. Yeah. Um, even though I was still following God, but, uh, wasn't really listening to all the signs along the way. Yeah. And, and that's great about the red flags is uh, there's obviously we talk about red flags in relationships and that's true, but there's red flags all the time. And a lot of times that's the Holy spirit trying to get our attention. You know, there's, we read the Bible and we, we like, well, that doesn't apply now. Or, you know, someone gives us wisdom, uh, a godly relationship in our life. And we, we just brush that off. Well, they don't know my situation, you know, and, and it, it really requires us to process it and go before God and say, is this red flag from you, right? Is this something that I should listen to? Because there's wisdom from other people. There's wisdom from the Bible. You're telling me through your Holy Spirit that there's a problem here. 
And it is, that is discernment is to listen to those red flags and take action upon it. And I had a similar example with relationships in my life too, before I was married. And uh, it's, it's funny because a lot of times we look at the situation we're in and we project it over 20, 30 years, you know, this job I'm in, I'll be in here for 20 years. I'll, you know, this church I'm in, I'll be in here for 20 years. This, you know, relationship before you're married, you know, obviously when you're married, it's forever, but uh, you know, we try to just project the rest of our life when it could be a season. And we can often make poor decisions when we just try to plan the rest of our life. And uh, we just have to take it, you know, a day, a season at a time, go before God in a new opportunity and say, is this, this might be where I'm comfortable. This might be where I've spent 10 years in a job, but are you calling me to do something else? And so, you know, we, we like to have it all planned out, but like you're saying, when you, when you get ahead of the game and you look back, you're like, wow, I didn't see the big picture and none of us see the big picture because only God can, but that's why it's so yeah. important, you know, with the, with the, the seasons we're in to just kind of take those before God realize that there are also poor, there's, there's difficult seasons in life. You know, maybe you're facing a, a medical condition. Maybe you're facing a relationship struggle. Maybe there's an unsaved loved one. There's all these things we go through that won't be your forever, but it's just like, now I'm in it. I need discernment. I need, I need peace from God just to get through this. Uh, there's hills and valleys in life. And when we're in that valley, we need to reach to God because he will take us through that valley and back on the hill uh, where he will be exalted and not, not ourselves. Yeah. And hopefully that's at least something that the last year has taught everybody is you better take it one day at a time. Cause you, yeah. you know, especially when the, the lockdowns first started happening and we're like, I don't, I can't make plans for tomorrow, let right. alone, you know, who knows about a couple of weeks or months <laughs> or whatever. And so I, I hope that more and more people have at least realized that truth of, I need to live for today and yeah. uh, enjoy it and see what God has for me today. 100%. Yeah. I mean, at the beginning of 2020, if people had all these plans, you know, imagine if God laid out the next year for people, you know, and just as clear as day, this is what the next year is going to be. It would be even more stressful than going through it in the moment because you're like, oh my yeah. goodness, I can't, I can't do this. But when yeah. you take it a day at a time in God's strength, you can do it. <laughs> yeah. If I would have known, like say April of 2020 that, Hey, this is going to last, continue into next year. Yeah. I mean, it would have, it would have been a completely different ball game. <laughs> right. Awesome. Well, let's talk about your book, Searching for Seven. So you say the Christian life is meant to be an adventure and a search for our maker and the truth. So can you expand a little bit upon uh, what your book, why you wrote the book and kind of what it's about? Yeah, I had this idea to write uh, several years ago and I, I wanted to combine my, um, 15 years or so of ministry experience with sports writing. Um, I love to write. And so I, th I was like, I, I think there might be something here. And it was one of those things where God, you know, again, laid that in my heart and, and eventually got to a point where I was like, I can't not do this. I just, it's got, it's overflowing. I've got to, got to do this. So I spent basically, uh, 2019, uh, writing it. And, um, again, a lot of stories and short chapters. Um, but I think this idea all of the, the points and stories that I've had in my life have uh, basically come to this point of saying, like, I want to follow God seven days a week and I want to worship him when I play basketball. I want to learn about him when I'm at work. I want, you know, all these, not just a Sunday faith. And, uh, and so that's what I was, what I was going for. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, being an adventure, uh, Jesus said to uh, believe, believe in me, but he said, follow me even you know, way more times. And, uh, I feel like, uh, too many, too many Christians, um, just want the, the comfortable, you know, I go to church and sometimes I read my Bible. Sometimes I'll pray if things are not going well in life. And that's the extent of their relationship. When he said, Hey, follow me, let's go. Um, you don't really see anybody in scripture having a boring faith or hmm, having right. a, having a faith that was not a constant journey and adventure. Yeah. And so, um, all the things that I've been able to experience in life and all the different uh, things that I've gone through have led me to that, that thought of like, I want to, I want to trust you and follow you every day, take up my cross every day. Um, and, and not just, uh, you know, kind of go through the motions in life. That's great. 
And you also say it's hard to find what we're not actively searching for. And I love that because actively requires action, right? We can't just be passive. You don't find things. You don't do well at your job. If you're just passive, you don't do well in, in your marriage. If you're just kind of passive, if you let it happen, it requires action to keep it where it's supposed to be. And, and same thing with, with our Christian walk, you know, we, we can go through the motions and that happens in seasons, but it's much more beneficial to us in our relationship with God. If we are actively seeking him, because even when you find Christ and, and have salvation, you never fully know God because we are not God. And so your whole life, the process of sanctification is about learning more about God. And, and it's such a fallacy to think that, okay, I know about God. I read the Bible once. Well, no, there's so much depth and wisdom that God will keep revealing to you. If you seek him, you will find him. And so yeah. talk a little bit more about just, you know, what it means to actively search for God. Yeah. You know, it's just so rare to find something if you're not actively looking for it. I mean, once in a while, maybe, Oh, I found some money and some old jeans and I didn't know it was there, but most of the time, and, and this goes both ways. If you're looking for trouble, if you, you know, if you want to go have an online fight with somebody, you can find it, you know, oh, yeah. like wh whatever you are looking for, whatever, you know, you are aware of, um, you know, even like a kind of a silly example, if you play the slug bug game, when you're, when you're driving, you're looking for <laughs> slug bugs, you know, like those kind of yeah. things can apply to God. Are you aware of his presence? He's always here. You know, I no longer, uh, I no longer pray, you know, God, um, God be with us or God, I hope, you know, hope you show up. It's more like, God, I know that you're here. Help me be aware that you are here. Help me be aware of what you're doing and what you're working right. on in my life and in other lives. And if you do that too, you start to see like every aspect of your life changes. I start to see other people as his children. I start to see a hard time that I'm going through as an opportunity um, instead of, Hey, I'm going to, you know, hang out with God on Sunday and that's it. You know, just imagine if our marriages were like that, like, yeah, I got to talk to you next week, honey, <laughs> you know, you know, see you Sunday for a couple hours. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's, you know, faith and action, you know, faith without action is dead. And it doesn't mean that we do things in order to be saved in order to earn God's love, but we do these things because we are loved because we are saved. And um, just every aspect again of your life, you're going to get closer to God. You're going to be more impactful um, in your life uh, for those reasons. If you're, if you're actively seeking him. Yeah. And I love that about prayer, you know, praying with the faith that God is hearing you, that he does hear you and not just like, if you hear this prayer, just kind of throw it out in the ether. No, God is, is living and active alive in you as a Christian. And so we need to realize that, that even if we don't necessarily feel God, that he's there. And so praying with the faith that God is hearing this and now it's up to him what he does with this, but at least you have that confidence of knowing that your prayers are heard. I think that creates a much more dynamic prayer life than just going through the motions, praying the prayers at, at, at bedtime or dinner, or, you know, even, even the, the Lord's prayer is a great example for new Christians, but it's also something that can be religious. If you just pray that only and don't pray with how the spirit's leading you or for real things in your life, like you would talk to your spouse, like you're saying, like you would talk to someone who's right next to you because God is. So that's yeah. great. So, we talked a little bit about 2020 and uh, just about how the church, you know, we talk about seven days a week, you know, searching for God seven days a week. But wh what do you think about the church with coming out of a year like 2020, where the church is not just about Sunday anymore? It's more about what we do on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So how do you think that this has changed or impacted the church to follow more of the biblical model and less of the Americanized version that we're used to? Well, I mean, it's definitely my hope that uh, that more and more churches and more and more Christians are, uh, you know, taking this past year to learn that, um, you know, I know in my own life, it's, it's how I've always been a, a patient person and I've always been kind of, you know, taking one day at a time, but now even more so. Um, but I think, you know, I know some statistics show that some people like a percentage of people have just stopped going to church and, and who knows if they'll come back. But there's also a lot of positive. There's a lot of people that have uh, got online for the first time to watch services. There's been uh, more engagement with, uh, you know, podcasts and different resources, um, the, the Holy Bible app and, you know, things like that, that we have at our fingertips. Yeah. Um, but I think it's, I think for the most part, you know, maybe this whole thing was, um, 
part of part of God's plan to slow people down and, and let them know like, Hey, <laughs> um, there's a lot of ministry to be done. There's a lot of, uh, hurting people and there's a lot of, uh, good, enjoyable things out there as well, um, that are meant to bring us into worship and, uh, worship the creator, not the created thing, you yeah. know, just the, the creations. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, our church and, and many other churches we've tried to do, you know, things more, uh, on a daily basis. Um, I try to release a, a show, um, try to do a, a weekly zoom. And I, and I always tell the, the students too, like, we're not doing this on Sunday because we're getting out of that mindset. So yeah. some other day of the week, the show is going to drop or the zoom or this uh, devotion. Um, just, we got to be creative and find different ways uh, to be the church. And I do think many churches um, have done a good job of that as a result of this past year. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And, you know, church on, if you just go on Sunday and just get filled up on Sunday only, you're, you're usually cruising into the church on fumes and, and then you get filled up and then you just drained again. And that, that's kind of what we want to avoid as Christians is to be filled up all week long because we have battles all week long. You have to go to a job you may not like, you have a family that might have strife and struggles. You might have health problems. And so you can't just rely on one day a week to get filled up. And that's kind of what you're saying is that, you know, the church has kind of Hopefully a lot of churches have, have woken up and obviously we can't speak for every church, but there seems to be a big uh, separation, separating between the middle ground of Christianity. There's some that have fallen away. There's some that are more passionate about Christ because of this tragedy and in, in this, this time period we we're in right now. Um, and so there's also benefit, there's positives of it. Like you're saying, there's the outreach of it, the, the, the positives of being online, uh, you know, more resources than ever. I mean, there's no shortage of sermons or, or material if, if you need to find out about Christ. And that's amazing. But there's also a laziness that comes with being able to do everything online. And so we really have to check our heart. If you're a Christian that needs to be in community and can be in community, because there's definitely still lockdowns going on and stuff like that. You know, I know personally people that just are comfortable live streaming, even though they could come to church, you know? And so you have to really ask yourself, is this, is this beneficial for my spiritual walk? Is there other options for me besides just doing what's easy versus doing what I'm called to do? And that kind of goes into my next point where you say every Christian should have their own ministry and it's in your chapter, when in doubt, serve. And I like that because if you don't know what to do, just serve somebody. Right. <laughs> and so, yeah. uh, talk more about what you mean by every Christian should have their own ministry, because I love that. Yeah. That's one of my favorite chapters. Um, I opened that with a story about this uh, scooter that's in my shed <laughs> that, uh, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll get it out and, and, and ride it in my little town. Um, the thing is, if I, if you don't use it in a, in a while, it stops working. It's, you know, not one of the high, high quality ones. You can think of other things in your, around your house, like the lawnmower, the, you know, whatever, something, if you don't use it for a long time, it'll stop working. I feel like we are wired in a similar way in our faith. Um, I believe it's in Ephesians that talks about, you know, we are created in Christ for good works, which yeah. he prepared in advance for us to do. So we were actually created for good works. We we're created to serve. There's gifts and talents, things that, that um, we can bring to the table. And if we're not using them, it's like, where that item in, in the shed that's just going to rot and, and waste away instead of uh, being used for its purpose. So I think uh, some of us have a pulpit and some of us don't, but we're all uh, called to be in ministry, you know, yeah. the great commission and to make disciples. And um, there's also, uh, there's a verse that says we have the, he's given us the ministry of reconciliation, mm. like an actual ministry of trying to bring people together and yeah. try to bring peace and, and talk about the political divide and talk about racial divides and all these, like we have a ministry of reconciliation, not just to sit back and let other people do it. Oh, that's for a pastor to do. But I, I have a ministry of reconciliation. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, that's again, where the action comes in and, you know, we've, uh, some people are, you know, maybe bored in their life or bored in their faith, go where God's people are, <laughs> you know, like how often do you hear someone come back from a mission trip and be like, I don't know where God is, right. or I just served in a homeless shelter, but God, I can't hear you. No, normally it's when I go and do things, yeah. that's when I'm like, oh my gosh, God is amazing. He, I, I can see him at work. So when we get off our couch and go do things, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, and take part in ministry. So, you know, get involved in your community and what your church is doing. Um, but you know, take, take the, uh, 
trying to think of the word there, but try to take the bull by the horns, I guess. Yeah. Um, grab some of your friends and go, go somewhere and serve and, and watch God work. And it, it'll be awesome. That's one of the huge differences in, in America. And, and you go to other countries is uh, we're so self-absorbed in America. And I'll speak for myself too. You know, we have my needs, my wants, my phone, my, my, my schedule, my agenda. And, and to step outside of that, um, to step outside of that requires uh, an action it requires us to, to think about someone else besides ourselves. And so there's, there's two parts of that I thought about is one is if you don't have an actual ministry or something you're doing, you can still be a light no matter where you're at. You talked about being online. You can spread life online instead of death in some of these comments or some of these, you know, posts that you see people doing that just tear down instead of build up. And, and so if, if you see someone's hurting, if you see someone needs prayer, if you see someone just f- feels hopeless, like we have the hope <laughs> that this generation needs. And so it's like, you know, it's like Jesus said, you keep your light, you don't, you don't hide, you know, your light under, so no one can si- see it. You, you share it so others can see the light of Christ. And so, you know, we have to look at the, the hurt and the needs and the pain around us and realize we have the answer. Whether they want to accept it or not is up to the Holy Spirit, but we mm-hmm. still have the answer for the pain of this world. And so to not be, to, to, yeah. and so that requires us to move in boldness, right? And, and to know that no matter if I'm shot down, no matter if I'm hated, no matter if, you know, all the persecution that the early church easily signed up for because they had that passion and they knew what they stood for. Um, and then that moves into the next point of, of having a ministry and using your gifts, like you're saying, because the gifts are for other people, you know, m- me using my gift will help others. But the cool part about that is the gifts God gives us, we're passionate about. And so when I use the gifts God has given me, I'm excited. That That's what energizes me. That's what gets me up in the morning to go do these things, so whether it means you're serving, whether it means you're preaching or teaching or, or loving or having, uh, you know, hospitality or even administration, like all these things that people are good at in the spiritual gifts that we're given. These are things for edification of the body, but also for ourselves. Yeah. And I even talk about, you know, those who struggle with um, loneliness or depression or suicidal thoughts, you know, I don't have all the answers for things that are that serious, but I do think um, when we go and and serve someone else, it feels like we feel like we have meaning and purpose. And, uh, you know, as you said, using your gifts, um, I, I feel the most alive when I'm helping somebody, um, doing something, whether I'm good at it or whether I'm kind of nervous to do it, but when it lifts someone else up, you know, it gives me life. And I think that's kind of the whole, whole point of, uh, or one of the points of discipleship yeah. and, and the church body. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Well, I want to, I wanted to ask you this question being a sports writer and, you know, is there any comparisons you've seen from following sports, writing about sports in sports and in our Christian walk? Cause the Bible talks about that, you know, boxing and running, running a race. Uh, what are some comparisons you've seen with, with coaching kids and also writing about sports that might be good analogies for us as Christians to, to understand? <clears throat> well, I will. The first thing that comes to mind is, I call it my basketball testimony. Um, God used basketball to get me to go to a Christian school, basically. Mm -hmm. And then that Christian school led me into youth ministry. And so there was like one particular game my sophomore year playing basketball that nobody, a game no one else would ever remember that changed the trajectory of my basketball career. And if that one game didn't happen, I'm not sure I would be where I am today in youth ministry. So you look back and think of all these things that God was doing. Um, I think too, from a, from an athletic standpoint, um, there's so many examples of perseverance and character and, um, you know, fighting through the struggle. Um, and I think, you know, uh, coaching, you know, when you're on the other side of it, you also kind of look at, uh, the hard work, the discipline. And I even try to let my players know that, Hey, as a player, I didn't like hearing this, or I didn't like this drill. So I know what you're feeling, but as a coach, I'm telling you, it's needed. We need to do this. And, uh, I think too, sometimes in the games our, our, if our team gets distracted and they're listening to maybe a parent or a fan or, uh, the other team, instead of what we're trying to do, if they're not laser focused on what our game plan is, listen to your coach's voice. All right. Drown everything else out. And I can't tell you how many times I've thought that in my life about 
wonder how many times God's saying that to me, you know, like yeah. he's, he's got the game plan. He's, he's got my back. He knows what's best, but I'm listening to all these other voices instead of his. Um, so those are a few things that come to mind. Yeah, that's cool. And I, I love analogies with like, you know, sports or even the military and our Christian walk and our Christian race, because it requires commitment. It requires, you know, just running a marathon, for example, which I've never done, but I've, I've heard it's hard. And I'm, I know there's a lot of training required in it. And I know it's not easy. And I know you have peaks and valleys in the marathon where you just want to quit or you just want to die, but you keep persevering because you know the goal. And so it's, it's so important as Christians to realize we are in a race. We're fighting a spiritual battle. You don't just show up, you know, for battle in your PJs, you show up and you follow your commanding officer. You, you put on the armor of God, which we're supposed to, and you follow what Jesus says. And so there's, there's such a, a, a cool uh, parallels between, you know, kind of the laziness we were talking about in Christianity, where we just kind of go through the motions, we show up and not realizing the stakes that we have that we're in that that other people are dying. And even as Jude says, you know, snatching them out of the fires of hell, you know, we have to have that urgency in our daily life, because time is a gift and we are not we're not guaranteed tomorrow. And so awesome. So Tyler, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, If you just want to let everyone know where they can connect with you and, and find your book. Yeah, I think um, the best place is probably the book's website, searchingforseven.com. Um, the book's available uh, pretty much everywhere, I think. But um, that site um, can also give you ways to connect with me if you want to chat. Um, it has a couple direct links where you can purchase a physical copy or ebook. So searchingforseven.com. Awesome. I'll put that in the show notes. Thanks so much for coming on. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Everyday Discernment Podcast. For more information on Discerning Dad, go to discerning-dad.com. Be sure to follow on all the social media platforms. Just search for Discerning Dad. Please share this podcast with a friend and leave an honest review on whichever platform you listen. Feel free to send any comments, suggestions, questions, or prayer requests at discerningdad at outlook.com. Until next time. Keep fighting the good fight.